Now, this is Jared Gardner and we're going to talk about atypical fibrosanthoma or AFX and how to differentiate it from uh, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma formerly known as MFH or malignant fibrocystocytoma and um, now called when it's confined to the skin and subcutis pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. So there's a lot of terms there to keep uh, straight and that's part of what makes this issue confusing. But these are relatively common um, entities to think about when you're looking at a, a skin biopsy like we see here of a malignant spindle cell neoplasm. So to start with, these uh, lesions usually occur on the head and neck of elderly patients who have had a lot of sun exposure. So the same kinds of places that you'd see more typical skin cancers like squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, or melanoma. And so clinically, they often um, present as an ulcerated erythematous scaly nodule. And you can see here's another piece of the shave biopsy. And looking at the top here, you can see the epidermis. There's epidermis over here on this side. And then in the middle, there's a big ulcer with kind of a, a crust over top or what clinically looks like, you know, scab or crust. And so these often uh, clinically look like squamous cell carcinomas and are basically impossible to recognize, I think, uh, clinically until you do a biopsy. So when you get the biopsy, it usually comes in like this, broadly transected across the bottom with the dermis almost completely filled with atypical spindle cells. So let's look closer and see what we have here. You can see even from, from here, which is this is the 4X objective, there are really huge, atypical, enormous um, nuclei, very pleomorphic that even from low power you can see. The cells are arranged a little bit in fascicles in some areas, a little bit more haphazard in others, and they make these diffuse sheets that fill up the dermis. There's nothing in the epidermis, there's no in situ um, malignancy. And so if you see the presence of carcinoma in situ or melanoma in situ over top of these, it can be helpful. So when you, uh, when you see a case like this, where you have a, a skin biopsy from the um, scalp of an elderly patient and it looks like very ugly, very atypical spindle cells, really three things enter your differential diagnosis uh, at first. The first would be spindle cell melanoma. Melanomas can take on a wide variety of forms and they can become very spindled and look very sarcoma-like. And so we call those spindle cell melanomas and they do not always have melanoma in situ component, particularly when they're ulcerated, the in situ component can be completely absent. So you have to think about that. The next thing you think about is spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma. Some squamous cell carcinomas become so poorly differentiated uh, that they don't look like squamous cells anymore and they begin to look malignant and spindled and, and ugly like we see here. And then if you've excluded those two entities, the kind of third thing in the differential is atypical fibrosanthoma or AFX. All three of these can look histologically identical on H and E or hematoxyl and eosin stain, which is what we're looking at here. And let me show you at higher power what I'm talking about. What these cells uh, look like, we, we said that they are very pleomorphic. Pleomorphism means that the largest tumor nucleus is at least three times greater than the smallest tumor nucleus. That's the way it was defined for me by Dr. Rowe, one of my great mentors in residency. So you can see this tumor has a huge, enormous, very hyperchromatic nucleus. Some of those tumor cells are much smaller. They're still way bigger than normal cells, but they're not as large. So the, the variation in size and shape from very large and irregular to smaller is what we call pleomorphism. And that's one sign of malignancy. And really that um, is one feature that suggests that a tumor has chromosomal instability or aneuploidy. Pleomorphism is, is a surrogate marker of aneuploidy. It tells you that there are probably multiple chromosomal gains and losses, and that in itself is a sign to su suggest malignancy. Obviously, there are exceptions. There are pleomorphic things that are benign in the human body, but when you have sheets of pleomorphic cells here, let's go to higher power and see if we can get better nuclear details. You can see here that these cells are very large. They have huge central nucleoli. Some of them are multinucleated. They're elongated and spindled, and they're very atypical. And you can look around and pretty easily there, that's a, a huge nucleolus right here. This cell, you can see that the large dark blob in the center, that's its nucleolus. It's the nucleolus of that tumor cell is larger than some of the other neighboring tumor cells, actually. It's a huge nucleolus. So that's another sign of atypia in uh, tumor cells. All of these are very atypical.
and somewhere around here, there it is. This is an atypical mitotic figure. It's a little bit hard to get into focus at this power, but you can see it's kind of Y-shaped, and you can see there's a nucleus in the background from another cell that's kind of overlapping, but this, mitoses are supposed to be symmetric, and this is very asymmetric, so that kind of classic tripolar or Mercedes-Benz mitosis, I guess this is kind of a crooked Mercedes-Benz, it's more like a tuning fork maybe, but if you have a tripolar or um, stick figure looking multi-armed mitosis, again, that's another sign of aneuploidy, chromosomal instability. So very ugly, very atypical tumor, and there's nothing here that would suggest what kinds of cells these might be. They're totally undifferentiated in appearance. So again, the differential, the main differential is spindle cell melanoma, spindle cell squamous carcinoma, and atypical fibrosanthoma. Uh, now a couple, well, we'll talk about in a minute, a couple other um, options that come up here. So the, the most important thing that you have to do here is you have to use immunohistochemistry to sort these out. There's no way to do it. Um, if you just have all ugly cells like this. If you have obvious areas that look like squamous cell or obvious melanoma in situ over top, that would be suggested that the whole thing is either squamous cell carcinoma or melanoma. But I've seen exceptions to that rule where you have squamous cell carcinoma on top and melanoma in the dermis. And so you can you can have more than one um, tumor at a given in a given biopsy. So always remember that. That's important to remember that patients can sometimes have multiple tumors in the same area. So what immunostains to do, I think, is a matter of some debate. And it's not necessarily a right or wrong issue, but I'll tell you the way that I like to do this. And my views on this have evolved a little bit over time, and they'll probably evolve more still. So in a few years, I may do this differently. There may be new immunostains that come out that we find that are even more useful. But I think that the most important things are to exclude melanoma and to exclude squamous cell carcinoma. So to exclude melanoma, I like to use either S100 protein uh, and or SOX10 immunostain. Both of those are highly sensitive markers. They're not totally specific, but they're very sensitive for um, melanocytes. And if I see a pleomorphic, high-grade malignant tumor in the skin and it's diffusely S100 or SOX10 positive, to me that's melanoma until proven otherwise. Do exceptions exist? Yes, exceptions exist to every rule, especially with immunostains. No immunostains 100% sensitive or specific, but I like S100 or SOX10. And um, I think SOX10, one advantage that it has is it's very clean nuclear stain, and also it does not stain Langerhans cells or dendritic cells, which S100 does. So in an ulcerated, inflamed tumor like this, S100 will often have a high amount of background staining. And sometimes for people that are not used to looking at these, it can be kind of confusing and make you want to think that the tumor is S100 positive. So here's an example of SOX10. And you can see that it's completely negative. Everything's that pale blue color. And as always with immunostains, it's very important not only to check your positive control on the on the slide, but also to check your internal control when, whenever possible. The internal control, that is cells within the tissue biopsy itself that should be positive, making sure that those are actually positive is the best way to make sure that you're staying worked because you're looking at the actual tissue that you're testing. And so uh, if there's a problem with the tissue or it isn't fixed well, hopefully it will show up with the internal control uh, not working and that will give you a clue that maybe you should, should doubt the stain and, and do something else. So here you can see up at the basal layer of the overlying epidermis, there are occasional nuclei that are staining red. So those are normal melanocytes in the overlying epidermis, and they're staining red with SOX10 on, in their nuclei. So those are, those are normal cells, and that shows us that the stain's working, but when we look here in the dermis, the tumor cells are completely negative. No nuclear staining at all. There's a light pink blush in the cytoplasm, but that doesn't matter at all. I find that that often happens in immunostains with a red chromogen, which is what we use on our SOX10. And remember, it's important to know where the immunostain is supposed to stain. If it should stain the membrane, the cytoplasm, the nucleus, or a combination of those, that's really important because here, a little bit of cytoplasmic staining with SOX10 means absolutely nothing at all. SOX10 only matters when it stains the nucleus. So SOX10 being negative, the chances of this being melanoma are close to zero. There again, exceptions exist. There are, you know, weird melanomas that lose S100 or lose SOX10, but they're very, very rare. I've only seen a few ever, and I've seen probably well over a thousand melanomas in my my short career so far. All right, so that ex more or less excludes melanoma. The next step is to exclude squamous cell carcinoma. Well, the obvious answer would be do cytokeratin. 
The problem is that spindle cell squamous carcinomas, as they become poorly differentiated, they often lose expression of cytokeratin. So you can do cytokeratins, and I usually will do a pan cytokeratin. Some people like to do a variety of a high molecular weight keratin like CK56, but my very favorite thing to do is to use one of these nuclear markers for squamous cell carcinoma, like P63. So in my hands, in, and so far in my experience, I've only very rarely seen spindle cell squamous carcinomas that are negative for P63. It happens, but it's really rare. So uh, P63, you can see, is a beautiful nuclear stain that highlights the nuclei of the epidermis. It will also highlight the nuclei of the hair follicles and sweat ducts and the skin and nexal structures. It's, it's positive in the vast majority of squamous carcinomas. It can also stain other types of carcinoma, like sweat gland carcinomas, urothelial carcinoma, and a variety of others. But it's rarely seen in mesenchymal tumors like sarcoma or AFX. So here you can see that the epidermis, again, is a nice, beautiful internal control, a nice nuclear staining there. And there's a, a new uh, kind of variation on P63 called P40, and both of those work similarly so far. I, I've used both of them with great success. So you can see that the tumor nuclei, though, are completely negative. And if you did a keratin, it would likely be negative too here. And so that's, um, that is a, a good, strong argument against the possibility of uh, this being a squamous cell carcinoma. All right. Now, that, like I said, rules out our main possibilities. There are a couple other entities you can think of. In this case, there was some fascicular growth that is... Um, tumor cells kind of streaming all in the same direction, like you can kind of see in the middle of the screen here. And that's one feature that can be seen in smooth muscle tumors like leiomyosarcoma. The leiomyosarcomas can occur in the skin and they can be very ugly like this, but when they're confined to the dermis, they have a very, very low chance of bad behavior. Chris Fletcher and um, Jason Horner, or I'm sorry, Chris Fletcher and Stephen Kraft have uh, done a study where they showed that there was almost no risk of metastasis basically when a leiomyosarcoma is confined to the skin. And they even argue that maybe we shouldn't be calling these sarcomas after all. So it's a good thing to think about. And my favorite stain for leiomyosarcoma as well as other muscle tumors is Desmond. Um, actin will stain them, but actin will also stain spindle squames and a lot of other things, myofibroblastic tumors. And so it's a, it's a really non-specific stain. So I'm really careful to use actin. Um, and I've seen a lot of people over-diagnose things as leiomyosarcoma because there was some actin expression. So I would urge you to use caution um, in interpreting your actin. Actin has to be strong, three plus diffuse staining um, before I would accept it for being supportive of something being a smooth muscle tumor in the absence of Desmond staining. So in this case, Desmond was done. And here, I'm gonna show you a control first. Here's a control of a leiomyosarcoma in the skin. You can see the epidermis up top is negative. And then the dermis is filled with smooth muscle bundles that are strongly positive for actin immunostain. So this is a control piece of tissue to show us what the stain should look like and to prove that the stain's working. Now when we look at our tumor, completely negative. No staining whatsoever. So that argues against this being leiomyosarcoma. And I've also rarely, very rarely seen rhabdomyosarcomas in the skin. They're very uncommon, but they can occur and they can occur in adults too. I, I wrote, uh, co-authored a paper with a few colleagues a couple years ago where we looked at a, a small series of uh, cutaneous rhabdomyosarcomas. And we, after scraping up several large consultation files, we only found 11 cases. So it does happen, but it's, it's uh, very rare. And I've also seen melanomas and squamous cell carcinomas very rarely show rhabdomyoblastic uh, uh, kind of transformation. So those things happen, but they're exquisitely rare and really not something you see often. But I often will include a Desmond in my panel to make sure that I'm not missing one of those. And then the one other thing I think it's a really important thing to think of is um, the possibility of angiosarcoma. And in this case, you see that there is, um, there is some background hemorrhage and uh, whenever we see hemorrhage in a malignant tumor, we always think about, could this be angiosarcoma? Angiosarcomas usually will have areas of obvious vascular channel formation if you get a big enough biopsy. But there are, uh, I have seen examples of angiosarc that had solid cellular sheets of spindle cells with no vascular channel formation, particularly in the center of the tumor, and that looked nearly identical to what we're seeing here. So I always keep that in mind because angiosarc is such a bad tumor and often behaves very aggressively, and it, it's quite different from 
a lot of other um, skin cancers and sarcomas. So it's an important thing to not miss. So I, I personally love ERG, E-R-G, as an immunostain. It's very, very sensitive. I've never yet seen a vascular tumor that did not stain with ERG. It's not totally specific. There's a few other things that can stain, like epithelioid sarcoma and prostate cancer and a handful of other things. But as long as you keep those potential um, pitfalls in mind and use it accordingly, it's a great stain. CD31 is also an excellent stain. Just keep in mind that it can stain histiocytes, usually kind of with a weak granular staining, but I've seen uh, histiocytes in the background of some tumors staining with CD31, and that's confused people occasionally um, for true tumor staining. CD34 will also stain angiosarcoma, but remember that 34 stains lots and lots of spindle cell tumors in the skin, and I've also seen examples of um, angiosarcoma that were negative for CD34. So it's not my favorite um, stain to use for vascular tumors. I really like ERG and CD31 best, and those would be negative here in this tumor, which would, would um, help kind of exclude that possibility. So when you've ruled those things out, what you're really left with is atypical fibrosanthoma. And um, the, the problem is, is that to, to be sure that something's an atypical fibrosanthoma, you have to know that it's confined completely to the dermis. And again, go back to what we saw at the beginning. You can tell that this case is broadly transected across the bottom tumor is present all the way across the deep margin. I have no way of knowing if this tumor goes down into the subcutis or is confined to the dermis. And this is, I would say 95% of skin biopsies I see like this are transected across the bottom and it, precluding the ability to evaluate the base of the lesion. So what I do for these when I sign them out is I call them pleomorphic spindle cell neoplasm the differential includes atypical fibrosanthoma and pleomorphic dermal sarcoma or undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. Um, and then I have a long comment that explains when you have to re-excise the tumor, if the tumor goes into the fat, it should be considered a sarcoma and considered as having metastatic potential. When these tumors are confined to the dermis, they almost never metastasize despite how very, very atypical they look. And that's why they're given the name atypical fibrosanthoma because they don't behave like a sarcoma even though they look like one. My personal view is that AFX and um, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma are really the same tumor, we just use a different name depending on how deep it goes. And um, more recently in the past few years, people have started to use the term, instead of undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma for these when they go into the subcutis, people have started to use the term pleomorphic dermal sarcoma to kind of indicate that these probably behave a little bit differently than the large, big undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas that we see like in the deep soft tissue of the thigh or other sites. So um, I've, I've begin, begun to use that term, but I usually uh, put a, a comment that pleomorphic dermal sarcoma is the term that's used for undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma um, confined to the skin and subcutis. But when those occur on the scalp, some of them still behave aggressively. And there was a recent um, paper uh, from Spain that showed that uh, almost 30% of them ended up getting metastases. Um, it was a smaller series, but I think that it, it's worth noting that these can behave aggressively when they get into the subcutis. So either way, you have to treat these like they're potentially a sarcoma, excise them with a margin ideally, and, um, and see how deep they go. So that's um, the way that I evaluate an ugly pleomorphic spindle cell tumor in the skin, and that's my differential on how I approach it. The one other comment I'd add is that I occasionally see residents um, have trouble with these and they see something ugly in the skin and spindled and they say, well, I think it's dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans, DFSP. DFSP is almost always bland cytologically, does not usually have pleomorphism. I've only seen one case in person that had pleomorphism and that's because it was radiated. And I've read rare reports where cases had kind of dedifferentiation into pleomorphic sarcoma, but it's exquisitely rare. And usually if I see uh, atypical mitoses and marked pleomorphism, that means DFSP is almost completely excluded. It'd be extremely unlikely to be uh, DFSP um, in that setting. So uh, just remember when you see pleomorphism, it's probably not DFSP. So that's my approach to atypical fibrosanthoma and um, uh, pleomorphic dermal sarcoma or undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. And I think the most important thing is to remember to exclude melanoma and squame and to make sure that if the margin's transected that you make a comment to your dermatologist or surgeon letting them know that this could be a sarcoma, this could behave aggressively. The only way to know is to excise this and to look at the excision specimen to see how deep the tumor grows. Thanks very much.